No, I, I wish I knew. Cyberbullying is a huge problem in America. You need to tell somebody. Over 3.2 million students are victimized in bullying each year. Approximately 160,000 teens skip school every day because of bullying. Are you the 160,000 that skip every day? Hey, it's not snowing anymore. I don't have to sign up for text messages. But Monco text messages aren't just for snow. What else are they for, then? In case of any emergency or weather-related closing. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm in the loop all the time. All you have to do is sign up. Where at? At mc3.edu slash txt, and it's very simple to sign up. Text Text messaging from from Monco isn't isn't just for snow. snow. mc3.edu slash txt. I don't think anyone knows really how to access Monco Radio. Is it, like, what's the station? I don't know. I'm sorry. Just putting that out there. You don't know how to access Monco Radio? Of course you do. You're listening to Monco Radio with music in mind. And welcome to this special edition of Meet the Press Slam on Monco Radio. I am your host, Danny Kugler, and my guest today is someone who is near and dear to my heart, um, honestly. And he's a big wig in the internet wrestling community. He's always posting great things on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and he's a wrestling connoisseur like that, Chris. <laughs> I called your friend Dylan Hales an independent wrestling connoisseur, which he is. Um, and so I thought... Uh, Calling you a wrestling connoisseur would be great. Um, and historian, and he has a huge collection of wrestling magazines, newsletters, and videos. He is one of the hosts of Between the Sheets podcast with David Bixenspan, and Exile on Bad Street podcast as well on the Between the Sheets feed, where he and various guests talk about, about a variety of topics in the wrestling world. He is also the moderator of Place to Be Nation's post pay per view shows with Devin Hales. He works at the grocery store, which you can hear all the shenanigans on the Between the Sheets Patreon page. He's an all-around good guy and a fantastic friend. He is Chris Zellner. Chris, how you doing today? Yeah, and all that stuff is true, too, which is, which is, which, when you build an introduction, you, you're, like Joe Lanza is the uh, uh, master of this, where he's like a reasoned and well-explained man. A pro- your problematic fave. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's good about you. Uh, that's definitely true. Thank you for joining. Jo- Thank you for joining me live on Monco Radio. We are live today. It's excellent. <laughs> Yes, and we we always we always do this. We've been talking about this for about like two years now, like ever since you were on getting the ring. Yeah, it's just something we've been doing for a long time ago, and yeah, it's been a while, and it finally worked out well. I was able to uh, be on the show, and join me live too, which is really, which is really a treat because Chris is a tr- is a true wrestling historian, and he knows the world of wrestling better than anyone else, in my opinion. Maybe Cubs fan. <laughs> yeah, you don't know everything. No one knows everything, but you know what you know. So my... So my first question for you is a doozy of a question. Um, so what are some of the broader things you have learned over the past four years doing Between the Sheets? Well, um, you know, one thing is when you do the research into some of these newsletters, um, especially the non-observable newsletters, like sports, Right. Observers have always been around, uh, whether it's the 
archives on the website or just people subscribing to it. And that information's been out there a lot, but the torch, the torch has been out there for a long time too, but people just don't really talk about the torch that much. And once you delve in there, especially as certain areas more than others, there's information that was not in the observer or never was in the observer, especially by ECW in the late 90s. With Jason Powell, correct? shows that we do the most when we focus on specifically one topic in general. Those are the shows that I really learn the most on. Right. I agree with that, too. I learn. We're focusing on one thing, and we're taking, you know, months worth of stuff and going into it. And Instead of a so week. Definitely learning, yeah, definitely learning experience. Yes, and I, I, I feel like, I, I as a listener to Between the Sheets, that I learn... Like this overload of information that you can't process all at once. That's why it takes multiple listens to a between the sheets to see, like where, where did this come from and how did this ha- happen? You know. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes you, I mean, it's like watching, watching television shows or watching movies. You know, you go, you go back and rewatch it or re-listen to it, and you'll probably find something that you missed the first time. That's, that's definitely. Yes, and with these shows, they're so multifaceted and multi-layered, as well. When 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 you did John Clark, for instance, for current uh, WCAU uh, mm, um, sportscaster and um, former, he's a local guy. And I messaged him. I was like, I was like, hey, I didn't know you did wrestling, <laughs> because he never mentions it, you know. So I was like, well, blo- I was blown away, and it's understandable, but at the same time, he responded to me, and he said, I did some wrestling back in the day. I don't follow it much anymore, but but I really appreciate the work that these guys did to bring my stuff back to light. He had a great uh, newsletter, Wrestling Flyer, which, uh, I mean, he gets some really exclusive interviews with uh, Watt, and, and other people that, uh, yeah, he's one of these that he just had a very short time and uh, he went on to do bigger and better things and yeah, stuff like that too. You know, there's other little niche newsletters that we've popped into in the past that, um, yeah, it, it, getting that information out there to people that wouldn't normally have that access to the information, that's always a good thing. How have you accumulated the newsletters? You use the Observer as a site, of course. Well, um, we're lucky in a way. Um, I have physical copies of some stuff, but I don't really have to, don't have to use them because I don't really have to. I mean, it's, in case some I can't read good off of uh, a scan, but we have to do the people that have uh, given us access to a special uh, dual drive. Oh, wonderful. Uh, of, of information and uh, that they have set up. And uh, it's been gone since uh, for some of, the, some of the stuff that we've had. Uh, of course, the uh, websites in general for the observing the doors, um, they're, they're, they're big helps as well for the stuff they have up. You know, certain times, but they don't have everything up. No. Observer, observer goes, there's their website, you know, you go from like 91. 202. To, to, yeah, to 2002, basically. Well, certain to point. They're just now in 2002. Right, so they just had, started. Yeah, because I had to, uh, we got 2002 coming up, and I had to uh, get them off of uh, that, it'll be dry, because it knows. 
And um, and then, of course, when they start putting them up aside after that, the mist is out, you have them up. Thor, Thor has mainly started in, like, night. And they got, they got a lot of them up in the old days, but, like, their old format started in, like, 93. And uh, they had so much evidence for the rest. So, it's, it, it, we're lucky that, like I said, that we have, you know, some people that have set stuff up for us, that have uploaded stuff that's easy for us to have access to. And is Bix the one responsible for wrangling up the clips? Um, well, he's the Bix, Bix, you know, my coach did Bix Man does, um, he does the producing. Uh, he does all the, um, the audio stuff and everything. Um, he, he's the one that sets all the clips up, yeah. I mean, I'll find stuff. I'll find the stuff, but we'll, we'll, we'll find some stuff. And uh, he'll be the one that set it all up, yeah. I'm, I'm not a producer. No. Yeah, you're. I, 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 I need to learn that type of stuff, but um, that's not my forte. Yeah, I I know what you mean. What what about doing between the sheets is throwing to you? Is it going through the newsletters, rewatching things, or doing the actual shows? Doing the actual shows probably, uh, because I mean that's the culmination of everything involved. I mean, yeah, you watch stuff and then you do know, but when you're actually um, making it come to life, that's the best part. Yeah, and it, it comes to life. It, it definitely comes through to the listener that you guys have a sort of camaraderie. You, Bix, when Alan's on, you guys do have a camaraderie. When, uh, when Bo is on, especially when Bo's on. Um, well, Bo, Bo James has become, you know, he's our constant guest. I mean, we try to have him on at least once a month, man. Uh, he's just... He, 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 a beacon. Nobody really liked him, really. And uh, so folks started out so young in the business, and he's been in the business for, for all these years, 30 years now. When did he start out? What, what, what's that? When did he start out? He started out... I mean, he started from up in town when he was 14 years old. <laughs> <laughs> he started from hometown. He started from his hometown for uh, Continental when he was 14 years old. And Continental and, was Rob Fuller, right? That would have been the end of Continental. Yeah, that'd been David Woods and Robert Fuller booking. Yeah. And then once they went away, um, he started doing independent stuff, and then he formed his own wrestling promotion, Southern State Wrestling. And uh, he was like. Uh, he was still basically a teenager man. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So, I mean, he, uh, and Southern State Wrestling is still going strong for Bo. He has his own streaming network, and you probably want to see for you all the information there. But, yeah, Bo, Bo is a treasure for us. And, and, uh, the treasure trove. Always, it's always great to have him on. It's, it's an easy show for Bo James. It's, we know... We know it's all not going to be good, and we just sit back and let it roll. And uh, there's other guests like that, too. Whenever Dylan Hales is on with oh, us, yeah. he's on show. Uh, Dylan can't be on as much as he used to because... Uh, he's Mr. Uh, independent Wrestling. Yeah, that, that's consumed his life. Uh, and, you know, and whenever we get on the... I mean, there are a lot of great guests that we've had on this show. Uh, Todd Martin. Our guest is great. So all we had on once, and we need to get him back on again, but our guest is great. Uh, Animal J is always fun to be on with us. Uh, Bruce Mitchell is always a great guest. Uh, we got a lot of great guests. Joe's supposed to just Dave Frazak of course. Can, oh, we, we can't leave out Dave Frazak. Um, Jordan Green always, uh, you know, got to get him back on again soon. So, yeah, Makabe on um, last week. Yeah, I mean, I think that Mike's ever been. We, 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 got, we got so many great guests. There's never been a bad guest on the Twitter sheets. That's one thing I could say. Of all the shows we've done, and not every week has a guest. And, right. But uh, every guest we've had has been a good guest. I've never said after the show that oh. I wasn't pleased with how that went. So. Yeah, because everyone brings a different perspective to the table, too. When you go into doing a Between the Sheets, you're the guide. And, like, like it was a great example listening to Daniel Makabe Tweet like listen, listen to him like do like DVD DVD VR stories and all this stuff, and he didn't remember everything, but but it was like great insight. Well, the fact that the 
fact is that, you know, I found out, you know, who he actually was uh, right before we started recording the show, and I've been knowing that guy for 20 years. And th- I mean, when I found out what his shoot name was, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> You're like, What? <laughs> And I like the rewatch aspect of it too. Like, like sometimes when I listen to Between the Sheets, I'll go back and rewatch that edition of World Championship Wrestling that's on the network or on YouTube, and and see what, and you can see what actually went on. And r- wrestling is just a beautiful thing, <laughs> isn't it? Some of the bad stuff, but I mean, WCW had a lot of bad stuff over the years. Oh, we'll get to that. Bad and for it. Yeah. Yeah, there's some stuff that I mean, like we watched some some of the ECW from the latter era. Oh yeah. It's cringeworthy. But WCW just has, I don't know, just an endearing thing for me that no matter how much I know this stuff sucks sometimes. It's still WCW. This is WCW, everybody. WCW, everybody. Speaking of one, two, three. WCW, everybody. Favorite, favorite WCW, everybody moments. There's a lot of them. Yeah, there is. I know. We could go like 45 minutes on this question. Center stage tapings and nobody knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's a line outside, and like, oh, it's center stage is like, oh, we're close. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. Um, getting, uh, getting Eric Young to show up to Alabama Border is always a good one. TV shows, uh, showing promos for shows that already took place. <laughs> uh, just stuff like that. I mean, you can't, you can't. Like, you can't do that sh- this crap anymore, and it's like, oh, my God. Like, Ring of Honor does it now, and you're like, this is bad. WCW has this endearing quality to it. Like, like it's like, okay, it's WCW. We'll excuse it. <laughs> or, I mean, if, if you kind of expect it, you know, it's like that for the whole company's existence. It was like that when Jim Crockett had it. I mean, they, they would make the things where you would just say, okay, right, well, we see where it comes from, you know? And there's other stuff that happened, too. And WF has those moments as well that we go over, but it just seems like WCW had more... It's a recurring theme. ...than any other company. Yeah, and it's like, it's like, it's easy to mislabel a tape, but, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. the amount yeah. of times... <laughs> Wrestling, and then figuring out halfway through the show, I was like, oh, we'll just keep playing. We'll, we'll keep watching this. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty yeah, ridiculous. It, 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 you know, like I said, like I said on the show, it is what it is. Yup, and you say it all the time, too, and it's like, yeah. <laughs> you, you, like some of the shows had me dying laughing. It, it's like, it's like almost like, okay, I need to calm down because this 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 uh, thing is like really just not just having me die right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's almost like that where you can tell that we're like that on the show too. Um, there's been moments with Dave Ray's that. That we've had, uh, James had oh, the most famous one. Um, the high spots, Rob Viper and uh, what's his Bahari, yeah. Rob Bahari and what's his other name? What's his friend's name from Calgary? Uh, uh, Robert O'Connor. Robert O'Connor. O'Connor. That episode, I swear to God, I listened to it three times because I'm like, <laughs> dude, I can't believe he's saying after the crap he's saying, and I'm like, oh, goes to Keone's. And you can follow him on Twitter. He, he he's a, he's a absolute joy, and and I messaged him after the show. I'm like, I wasn't expecting you to be this good, but you are this good. Yeah, he uh, he's definitely uh, 
the central character, to say the least. And uh, it's something else that we got to get on back into. We just got to get the right, we have the right topic for him because he, he, he definitely, uh, he has his opinions and he's something else now. I don't know about honor. And we were told that guys, you know, once you have a honor on, I mean, it's, it's going to be something else. And it definitely was. What, by Viper? The different type of guests that we have, uh, there's, uh, you know, different, different types of guests, you know. And, and Rob Ahar, I kind of love Rob Ahar for years, and um, he's a great guest as well. You had Joey freaking Janela on. <laughs> Joey Janela, yeah. Joey's a, and we're going to get Joey back on again in the future, too. Joey's a great guest. Uh, he's a, a fan like all of us was. You know, he's younger, though, than me, and, at least, but How old is Bex? He sounds young. And, uh, he's, he was a great guest. And I wish, you know, wish we would have had him for more the show, but he's a busy man, everybody knows. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, we're going to try to get more great guests and more you know, different guests in the future. And, uh, yeah, we're just going to keep going as long as we can. How old is Bex? Bex is... He sounds young on the show. That's why I you know, wonder. He's, he's, all, he's always young to me. I mean, basically, because I've been known since a kid. He's a teenager. Right, because he was calling into the Yana shows, right? Well, Bix, I mean, when I first had a conversation with Bix, he was 16. So Bix is basically 35 this year. You're, make, I, you're making me feel old because I'm 23. <laughs> You're uh, but, yeah, but uh, yeah, makes me 35 this year, so, uh, yeah, yeah it, it's like you, it's always, seen, you know, it's always just seen the same age to me. And when I, and when I saw him on the Hogan documentary, I'm like, dude, I did not expect him to walk like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know what people look like. Okay? No. Sometimes, sometimes you can get a grasp and be correct, but, you know, sometimes you can't. I mean, a lot of people I've met from the online community where I met them on, so I've well, never seen a picture before. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like, when I first saw Joe Lanza, I'm like, yeah, that's Joe Lanza, you know? <laughs> um, some of us like anonymity, too, like myself. Yeah. So, I would recognize your voice, of course, but... but yeah, but, I mean, I, I, I like, I like, you know, I'm just... Me, I don't like putting my photos out there for, for various reasons. So, I mean, I yeah, you just want to go to work in the morning. <laughs> yeah, you just want to go to work in the morning and and not be bothered at the grocery store because that would be annoying, wouldn't it be? Like if everyone knew who you were. Specifically, that have listened, uh, but they make because they saw it on Facebook. Right. Like that. But yeah, I mean, I kind of want to keep, you know, my, my private life and the internet life a little different. Yeah, you yeah. Know, so. Yeah, they're sort of blurred for me because I, I'm in the bit business. I, I'm at the Monster Factory, so it's like you have to promote yourself, you have to show your photo out there. But with you, it's, oh, yeah. it's like more like private in like the way it, it's done. Um, we sort of touched on this when we were talking beforehand. Uh, which shows are most meaningful to you? What topics really tickle your fancy when it comes to Between the Sheets? 80s shows are always the best shows because that's, I mean, that, that's what I grew up with. That's my childhood. Um, early 90s, far and away, too. Those, those shows always have a new and dear place to me because of, I mean, I just... That's where I grew up. Right. Uh, played, played great clips and stuff like that. And just, there was so much great wrestling around the country. And there was all these other promotions that were still around. And the world, too, so, because of Japan. World, yeah, and Japan as well. Um, those are always great. Um, hmm. I mean, any time that we cover... Uh, USWA! <laughs> 
<laughs> I wanted you to do that. Every time that we uh, have the Corey Mack clip, the Corey Mack clip, uh, announced it for USWA in the 90s, anytime we had that stuff, it's always good. And, uh, and your impression of him is spot on. <laughs> it, I mean, I, <laughs> well, it, sometimes I, I do it better than others, but uh, it's if I don't have any sickness or anything. But, uh, I mean, it was always great. You, and the USWA clips is great. Smokey clips is great. I mean, the mid '90s, you know, with those promotions, and ECW when it was at its best. Like '95, '96. Yeah, those that, that era is just always fun to cover. Um, and I, in 2000, in the in, in the uh, we haven't done a lot of those shows because they are very long. But you know, the, the early 2000 US indie scene is always great. Oh yeah. I mean, I was, I, I was such a big part, you know, being part, such a big part of that boom with the Dead Body Driver guys, and we were, you know, not to, you know, pat ourselves in the back, but we were... The up, driving we force. We were kind of like pacemakers at the time, you know, that, that board, and, you know, putting that, that stuff out there and being a part of it, knowing guys that were in the business then, just friends of mine and stuff like that, being able to talk about that to a generation that was very young when those shows were going on... Because you look at it now, I mean, Ring of Honor is now 17 years old. Yeah. It's amazing to think about. Ring of uh, Honor is a teenager. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just almost old, you know, almost old with the vote. So, I mean, you, you look at, you know, that stuff's been now so long ago that people listen to the show, and I know this from interacting on Twitter, that there's people that weren't even born. Yes, I mean, we have listeners that are under the age of 18 that, you know, that, that weren't born yet that's finding out about this stuff. And This is why wrestling history needs to be alive. I'm going to get on a diatribe right now. Um, This is why wrestling history needs to be alive in the actual history of the business, not what WWE wants it to be mold. Because... Well, they do a great job of what they do, but you guys, you, you, you got to take the full, you know, story. You can't just go... Through. You can't take everything that they say as a god. No, and you can't take everything that Dave's. You watch it, you watch it, you enjoy it, but you know you just can't believe everything. And but you the wrestling business, the wrestling right? The wrestling business is full of carnies. You know I mean? And it's like you can't take anybody at total face value, like Dave Meltzer or Wade Keller or Steve Beverly or Brian Last. Do you think and Dave got the bad rap? Do you think Dave specifically got the bad rap? Um, now or forever? Both. Um, because I think. I say, I say forever, yes. I say now he's done a lot of he's done a lot of things to warrant. Yes. The criticism he gets now, but uh, all times, yes, absolutely. Dave Meltzer is a huge, important part of this business. Has been for many years. Um, and I was arguing. In a lot of ways. And I was arguing with the, this with people that don't really know. And I listen to Between the Sheets every week. I'm immersed in 605. I'm immersed with Brian Last and that whole community. That what Dave does, even though you might not agree with everything he says, like the apparent sexism or this or that or any, anything like that. And I have several questions about this. Is like, is like, it's different. It's different than what a Bill After was. Bill After is universally loved. He's from my area. Um... And you, you know what I mean, though. But people in the biz. And Stanley Weston. Um, I'm not saying I, I, no one can be universally loved. Not even God. <laughs> um. Yeah. But at the same time, you you look at the way Dave's treated to the way Bill is treated, um, and the way Wade's treated, 
in comparison to the way Dave Street and, and stuff like that. I have several questions on that because I, I, I find it holistically interesting. I mean, Dave, you got to remember, Dave's a guy who is now uh, 60. He's, yeah. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's my dad's age. Yeah, he's, a, he's, a, he's been doing it forever. I mean, he's been, he's been riding stuff since the early 70s. Right. So, I mean, he's, I mean, he's getting close to 50 years of being, you know, around in wrestling fandom. Um, so the, the fact that he's been at this long is, is, is a definite credit to today. Yes. It, and without Dave, there's no between sheets. Right. I, and, I said that. And we know that. And without Dave, without Dave and Wade, there's no between sheets. So, I mean, we owe our any success that we have today. <laughs> I mean, Dave and Wade. I mean, and Steve Apple and other people too that have written newsletters, but I mean, without them, we have no show. Right. So. Right, and you know, I mean, I mean, everybody. Dave has, his, like I said, Dave has his faults, and everybody does. Yeah, and everybody does, and that's why I give him a little more slack than some other people, um, honestly, because. And, and we can't, and we can't blame Dave for the. I mean, yeah, he, he has his thoughts and stuff he puts out there, but I mean, he has some sycophants that kind of make it all worse too. Yeah. I mean, but that, but that's expected. Yeah. People, you know, that that have, you know what Dave has as far as like um, the penetration and stuff like that. Right, and the sycophant actually make it worse. You know what yeah. I you know what I mean? The people who f- f- fixate on everything Dave says, and I'm like, don't do that. You're gonna freaking kill yourself doing that. Yeah. But my fifth question for you, we, I've gotten, we gotten into a lot of great conversations here, and I, I'm loving this right now. How has the newsletter game evolved from, like, the, say, 1970s, 1980s to now? Is it the advent of the internet? Is the thing that changed the course of wrestling forever? Absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a huge factor in it. Um, it's hard to do the 80s shows because, you know, a lot... Shows there's not a lot of hard news, especially the early observers. Oh, yeah. Observer started, I mean, the Observer was a fan thing. It was a fan newsletter for, for years. And so they finally started getting, you know, sources in the business that would give them information. And then it became more of a newsy thing. I'd say when they started writing for the National uh, in 90, the uh, daily uh, sports paper that came out, that was Frankie Forbes. And once he wrote the wrestling, he wrote a weekly wrestling column in there. He got that credibility there, and then that that started it. And then the uh, the missing and steroid situation, the trial, and all this stuff came out. That's what really you know set him up to be the guy. That's right. But when it comes to wrestling, um, with that right there, so we're looking at '92. So that definitely was part of it. I mean. It, the, the, the late 80s, early 90s in the newsletters is, you know, the, the beginning of it. And the 90s, as it went along with that, was a true heyday. And now, the thing is, what's changed so much in the last 10 years or so is that social media becoming as big as it did. Now, the, the actual wrestlers and the promotion themselves can control the information. Oh, yeah. And they'll play. They can break the news. They can come out and have, they have their voice out there saying this is false or this is not the real thing that's going on. And it's allowed them to contradict or to eat or contradict or to confirm what we get reported. Um, do you feel like WWE doesn't do that enough? Um, because they can really control the narrative and they... In my opinion, has it? Here's the thing with WWE right now. It's way different than it's ever been because you can get more information out of WWE from people that are not actually reporters in the business now than you can from the reporters in the business. Right. Uh, Because there are multiple people online that talk regularly to WWE talent and 
word gets out there on Twitter, especially if you're like, you know, DMs or just getting out there on Twitter or on Twitter, however, that the information is out there in that way and the newsletters have to be reported on it or whatever. Um, and there's some, my, my job is to have some pretty good sources in the company. Sean Ross Sapp is probably the best. Yeah, I was going to mention him. What's going on? And, and, and the, you would, I mean, Sean Ross Sapp is pretty plugged in. He's one of the new breed of uh, wrestling journalists out there. And uh, I'm a big Sean Ross Sapp guy. I really enjoy him, and he's really good at what he does. So, I mean, he's one of the new breed out there with uh, Fightful.com. So, definitely check him out there. And, um, yeah, it's Fightful, good friends of the show. There's more people that's in it now. It's not just day two or three with Dave and Wade. No. Uh, you know? How did Mike Johnson get his start? I'm just wondering. What's that? How did Mike get his start? Mike. Johnson, yeah. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike's been around for a long time. Uh, Mike was around with OneWrestling.com. Uh, that's when he first got out there with Bob Ryder and Dave Shearer. But Dave Shearer still writes with uh, Michael PWM Insider. PWM Insider broke off of One Wrestling. And, uh, yeah, he's been doing it for years. Mike was an ECW guy. Right. You know, that's really, guy really made his pay. And, uh, yeah, he's been, he's been in it for over 20 years now, so... Yeah, it's amazing, like, how these people age, and then you see the new breed, and there's sort of a reluctance, almost, to, like, see, say... Say Sean WhatsApp, there's like, oh, look at this guy, you know, you know, he's he's not doing it right, you know, but he is doing it right. And Sean's a stand-up guy. Yeah, he's a young guy in his early twenties. I mean, he's definitely um, covered a niche for himself in the new wrestling media. How do you feel the wrestling media is treated? How do you feel the wrestling media is treated? Not well. Um, by wrestling fans in general? Um, yeah. <laughs> general edition. They pretty much see through them now. Um, because the thing is, a lot of your established wrestling media has let their personal feelings get ahead of their ass to report. And I think that's a problem. Here's the thing, though. If you're going to do that, you just have it up there front. See, Dave, Dave used to be like that. Dave has now reverted back to more old 80s Dave than he was in the, in the late 90s or what have you. Um, he's definitely gone back to push it. You know, it's become more of a fan again in a lot of ways for who Dave likes. And Wade has that through his horse where his favorites the people he don't like. But, I mean, that's the difference. Although, I think, let's be honest, I mean, real media these days has pretty much become that way, too. Yeah. I mean, I mean, all your political media is all about pushing, about pushing their narrative they want to push for whatever they feel. So, there's, there's nobody really... There's no escaping that, it. ...that's pushing real journalism, quote-unquote. I mean, Sean Ross Sapp, again, does that, and I know I'm really saying his name a lot, but he, he really does the best job at probably doing that where you don't see a bi- real bias in stuff he just puts out there and but that's that's the world that's, that's the world of that yeah for sure is you don't have nobody that's like I said pushing their narratives out there to try to report stuff that's bad right and and like the way like and I know Bix has gotten on a lot of diatribes about this like well you know he's biased too Everything and that's it, you know. And I do too, but I'm not. A, but I'm not a reporter. <laughs> and this is Colin as well. I mean, he he's kind of different in that way. So he he has more leeway and and, and feeling the way he does and the same stuff that he does because of that. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I if you're going to be a quote unquote real reporter. You know, you just gotta be careful, I think. You know, you can't. Yeah, and it's sort of like you feel differently 
about everything. And it it's a murky line. It really is a murky line. Um, how has Dave Meltzer, Wade Keller, Steve Beverly, Bruce Metro, and the fan club newsletters changed the way wrestling was viewed? Well, you get to see it from a different light than you would have from uh, the magazines. The magazines were all, you know, about pushing the, the, the work part of it, the narrative part of it, or creating their own stories, manufactured stuff. Um, for some magazines, that's their job. Um, the newsletters, to sell newsletters, they need to get out there and have news. <laughs> and you don't have the news that people want to read, and then you're not going to be successful. Right. So they're getting out there and doing what they got to do to get it out there. It's like any other type of publication. You know, you gotta you gotta have the goods to appeal to your to your public, to your, your consumers. And if you don't come through with it, then they're not going to be uh, supporting you much longer. Right, because I know somebody who runs wrestling news source, um, dot com, and it's like, like we just gotta keep pumping out, pumping out. Like the daily DDT is the same way. Like the site I'm involved with, and I'm like, guys, it's not that serious. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's not that, that goes to another thing that really changed about the. The business, you got a lot of these websites that are out there that, I mean, they are more aggr- aggregators than anything else. Yeah. I mean, they're taking stuff from other places and they're putting it out there. And that's where people are getting it. Getting it is they're getting it through them instead of getting it directly from the source. Which, hey, whatever, I'm, I'm not going to offer it. But, I mean, I'd rather get it directly from the source, personally. Yeah, me too. I mean, it is what it is. So, I mean, I'd rather just get it directly from the source. And not have to go through, you know, whatever you might go through to get it. Yes. So, so this is the major question. Uh, do you think the God status of Dave Meltzer has gotten annoying or condescending to people? How do you feel about Dave responding to every Joe Schmo on Twitter who doesn't know better? What does Dave have to do to gain the reference he once had? Dave's Twitter is Dave Twitter. Um, Dave has kind of like a Twitter gimmick he basically does. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know why, you know, why he always does what he does. You know, um, that's him. Um, it can get annoying at times, but again, that's his Twitter thing. So if you, if you don't want to, you don't want to see it, then just not follow him. Mute him. him. Or do whatever, you know. That's the way I look at it. I mean, He's going to do what he does. Uh, regarding God's status, I mean, <laughs> I mean, he is the guy for that's been the guy for wrestling information for all these years, and there are a lot of people that take what he says as the gospel. Right. Right. Well, maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but I mean, it just. People don't do what they're going to do. Uh, right. And me and John, I had John McAdam on yesterday. John's a great guy. Um, and oh, yeah, he's... Yeah, the great 80 series. Um, and he's like, he's seen people mentally break down in front of Dave. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, how does Dave handle it? <laughs> I, I have no idea without him. He's a, uh, he's a celebrity in his own way, and there are people that have reactions to celebrities. So I can understand it in that way. It is kind of odd, but I can understand it that way, looking at it from that direction. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> I've never met Dave personally. I hope one day I will get to meet Dave personally. But, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely interesting. I, that would be an interesting meeting of the minds. <laughs> To say the I least. Know, I've spoke with him, you know, online many times. I've never had a phone conversation with him. And, uh, you know, I would like to try to get him on between, between the sheets or something. Well, that may not be as likely these days, but like, at least I saw bad streets. So. Yeah. They, um, what are the main differences between Meltzer and Keller and, to a lesser extent, Matt Alvarez and Mitchell you've noticed through the years? 
He's a guy that kind of goes for, uh, I'm going to say more comedic way of doing it. used to be more comedic way of doing things with the whole weekly and stuff like that. But he has, I mean, he just has his own way of writing, which is different than anybody else. Bruce is Bruce. If you, if you meet Bruce Mitchell in person, then you understand completely the call. Bruce is a funny guy. And Bruce has an interesting way of looking at the business. And he's been a fan of forever. A staunch Jim Carter Mercer's guy and everything like that. And he has a certain way that, you know, he looks at the business and it makes him different than everybody else. It's like Alvarez. Wade, Wade is he's more of a tempered approach kind of guy. Um, you know, the thing about Wade is you, you know when he likes it, you know when he doesn't like it. He's more vocal lately than he used to be. Yeah, I noticed that. I really noticed that. He's definitely got more vocal in recent times, but um, well, again, Wade was more measured. Wade would have a different approach. He had his own different set of sources that nobody else had. So you know, he had no matter what <coughs> Vince. There. So he had he had things that they didn't have, and Dave was just Dave. Dave, then Dave, the same way for all these years. You know, you read him. You read them in the 80s, you read them in the 90s, you read them in 2000, you read them in, 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 in 2010, the teens. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's, that's very similar there, just the way he is. I mean, he, there's been a few changes here and there, but he's pretty much the same type of guy. Right. So, um, that's about the only thing I can really say on that one. What has Vince's relationship been with the newsletters? I think you've well, covered that well, enough. Well, He's had good relationships with Dave and Wade. He's had bad relationships with Dave and Wade. Uh, there was time when Dave was actually, I want to say on the payroll, but I mean, he was working as kind of a consultant in the UFO and I. They had, they had the big meeting at Tide Towers in 91, you know, where he brought Dave, Dave in, Wade in, other members of the rest of the media, and and um, had a meeting there. I mean, it's just, it's, lately it's been more rocky than other times, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Especially with the digs at, uh, Coachman. Yeah, they don't know what you're going to get with him, so, you know, that's about it. What about the other wrestlers and the other talent and the newsletters? Well, I mean, there was a time here when that was definitely a, 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 a big thing. Pillman. For, uh, so Brian Pillman was, was tight with everybody. Eddie Gilbert was probably the tightest out of anybody with those guys. I mean, he, Eddie, because Eddie grew up in that business. Eddie was a fanzine guy. Eddie was a magazine guy. I mean, if Eddie would never become a wrestler, that's probably what he would have done. Uh, he was a photographer. He did stuff like that. He wrote stuff up. Uh, so Gilbert had that. Cornette had that. Um, those guys that were coming from that, that were friends with, with all these people before they were actually in the business. So you, you had those relationships going on. Um, Chris Jericho has always been tied with a uh, way, of course, had Jericho as well, Sean Waltman, um, a lot of other guys in, in that Minnesota area. Yeah. So, wrestlers have had good relationships with the newsletter. On up the years, and of course, that's the thing with Mike Johnson. Mike Johnson, at one point in time, was, was getting all the big WWE stuff more than anybody else was because all the ex Indy guys, you know, had come into the company that he had been friendly with and, and stuff like that that I know that it's all to he was able to get information from them. PW so, Spyware. <laughs> I just had to I mean, make that joke. I mean, yeah, I mean, so yeah, I mean, it definitely helps to. to have those people in the know to feed your Yeah, and PW Spyware. <laughs> we had to make that joke. Well. Actually, I never, I never had to deal with that. <laughs> I mean, I've gone, I've gone there, but at least, you know, my computer is pretty strong with uh, antivirus. So I never had to deal with that. No, I think I, I had one incident with PW Insider. That's it. <laughs> um, yeah. Back in, like, in my early fandom days, um, yeah, it, it's really weird, um, like how how everything like different people are different are differently tight with the newsletters, like writers, stuff like that. Y- you know what I mean? Oh yeah. 
And it's always interesting to see what information gets out. Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes uh, stuff gets out there, and sometimes uh, stuff gets uh, hidden in secret. The, the perfect example of it uh, in, in recently is uh, my friend Stokely Hathaway. Uh, when, he, when, when they announced he got signed by WWE, no one saw that coming. Yeah, he didn't tell anybody. That stuff was very tight lipped. And uh, when they got out there, I was like, whoa. I mean, it came out of nowhere because, you know, uh, I mean, even people that knew so good well was like, wow, I mean, we, we didn't know this was coming. And that's very rare these days in wrestling for something to not get out there like that. Because, like, the whole February signing class was out before they announced it. Oh, yeah, I mean, God, I mean, I, I, I knew what people signed. Oh, I knew, I I knew Nick Camarado was signed a year ago, <laughs> like literally, literally. That stuff gets out there more now than it's ever been. Yeah, you know, and like I said, Twitter being what it is, Facebook being like it is, uh, people don't know what's going on. That's where dark wrestling Twitter comes. Yeah, and you don't even have to be on dark wrestling Twitter. Yeah, but you know, get out there eventually, you know. It does, it always finds its way. Yes. Um is there a week that that you that would even been requested that you would not do for any reason? Maybe I got this question because remember I had a Patreon Q and A. Um, I asked about the Benoit situation and your memories behind that. I don't think you would cover that week. Is there like a no go week? There's not one that uh, there's not a week I wouldn't do. We did that one on. Right. Uh, that was a I think that was a show. Um. That was a tough, I mean, that was a tough, the problem with the toughest week to do, uh, at least the police step was another one. That was a tough week to do because that hit people hard. Um, stuff like that, I mean, those, when, you, when, you, when, you, when your main story is a tragedy, then that, those are going to be the toughest ones to do in that way. Um, yeah, we haven't done the bit one step yet, and um, I know we'll have to do it eventually. But, uh, I mean, there's nothing I won't say not to. Right. Let's do it. I mean, if we, if we stay, I mean, we're staying true to our show, we're, we have to do every week that we can. And until, you know, whatever. Until we can't do no more. So, we can't skip nothing. That, that would be depriving our listeners of something that needs to be heard. Um... So, what have you? I mean, just because just because it's bad doesn't mean it's that we can you know erase it from history. I mean, it's it's part of history. It has to be out there for people not to know and understand. Right. What you know, what was the thought process at the time? What was you know? People need to know. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that anomaly of like, like even though this was bad and it's going to be painful to go through. Like, this needs to be out there because somebody might do it again. Well, I hope not, but you never know. I mean, and it goes, I mean, stuff like that goes on every day a lot, too. But yeah, hopefully we'll have, that won't happen in wrestling. Right. As a fan, what is your advice for reading into what Dave and Wade say or any other newsletter writer? Is there an exact science behind it? Speechless. Speechless. I re- rendered Chris Zellner speechless. Uh, like, you've been reading these newsletters for many years, and you've been, like, yeah. like y- you read into what they say all the time. Like, yeah. read between the lines sort of stuff. And you have to do it with Dave, because Dave will leave a nugget of information out 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, there's stuff in there that you definitely are just kind of vague and for a reason, and stuff that could be out there that you, like you said, we live in a lot, for sure. So, you, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of... A science. Yeah, and you kind of have to... When you do enough of it, you, you'll, you'll understand. Yeah. Yeah, I think and that would be. What have you learned from uncovering some of wrestling's greatest mystery, mysterious factoids and mysteries? Was that an intention on your guys' part, or is it something that just happens? Well, stuff just happens. Um, like that Paul Heyman, Eddie Gilbert stuff. That was enthralling radio right there. Well, the, 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 um, that was. Uh, probably the biggest one, though, was the, uh, when we did the Global Patreon show. Oh, yeah, I remember. Oh, Lily and just on a log, just fighting, doing research on all these names that were involved and finding out this stuff through uh, the state of Georgia business websites. We were uncovering stuff and uncovering connections there. I mean, that's good stuff. I mean, you know, that's stuff that's not, that's not playing. It's all that's off the cuff. No, and we've had a few of those things. Um, and it's Bix's nature to ask questions. That's something that I always enjoy about Between the Sheets. So Bix always has a question, and it's like, I don't know. Let's look. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I know people are like, oh, you just Google, Google the show, something like that. Well, sometimes you need to do the research on the show while you're doing the show to, uh, Find out the information you need to find. That stuff never bothered me. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's what it is. It's part of what we do. We can plan out so much, but sometimes things happen spontaneously. Yeah, and it's sort of like it's a mismatch of things. Like that, that global show, I remember listening to that. I'm like, what did they just uncover? <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Great information on that show. That's one of our that's some of our best stuff is the Patreon shows. And I say about all of our Patreon shows. I mean it costs five dollars a month. People do be on and Patreon dot com slash sheets and I say that we put out shows that are worth that month. Yes, because it is worth it. I, I have subscribed in the Patreon in the in the past and it's something where you learn something that you weren't looking to learn, but, like, it's sort of like when you did the expansion shows, it was like, like the Mafia connections. Yeah, that was Japanese, the Japanese stuff, yeah. And, man, the Mafia and the wrestling, what a history that is. Way back in the day, but I mean, that, that stuff in, in Japan still goes on today. So, yeah. Has their hands in it, sure. What lessons should wrestlers, promoter, promoters, promotions, and fans should learn from listening to Between the Sheets? Um, don't repeat the mistakes other people made. You need to go back and listen. History repeats itself, and it has a lot of times. Go back and listen and learn and figure out hey, we don't need to go this way. We don't need to do what they did. Yeah. Whoever, whether it was the WWE or New Japan. Whatever, you know, any other promotions, any promotions, just learn from the mistakes. And there were a lot of mistakes made. And well, that's, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Even during WWE's best year, 2000. And it's something something that struck me. is like, they're on the stock market, and they were only making $16 a share in 2000. Right now, they're at $93 a share. Yeah. And uh, that's worst. Different time, different time and place. I mean, a lot of things have changed. Yeah. Um, and it's something that you need to learn. Yeah, and it's honestly incredible to see... Um, like what goes into um, um, 
stuff, um, you know, and it's it's incredible. It's just incredible the fountain of information we have now. Because I can pull up All Japan Pro Wrestling from 1993 up on YouTube and watch that and share that. I, I showed somebody the 03 Misawa Kobashi match for the first time um, that they ever saw. And they were like, jaw jacked. And there was a lot of great stuff in there. And then you, you, you look and then you look. Like something I covered uh, was uncovered recently, the Knoxville Five. Even. Yeah, well, that's been around since I put it out there. Really, that's been around. Bo, Bo, Bo James had that for years. We never thought to say this is an. He, he's known on it. Let's put it that way. He's known. Yeah, he's the first one to brought that to us. No, I think. Yeah, and that. Before, 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 I mean, it, it had hit. It, it, it had a small, uh, small Facebook account, and we watched it, and then it was like a few days later when we started getting traction and everybody else. And it's an incredible video, like Bob Roop, Bob Orton. What they were going to do was they were going to trust in that the Jim, they were the Jim Crockett trying to force him to do something, and they were like, Crockett's like, screw you. <laughs> right. Right, because you're, you're exposing the business at that point. When it yeah. didn't need to be exposed, and then Vince did what he did. Yeah. How different would wrestling be if the cat wasn't out of the bag before the internet, and then the internet exposed the bag? No, it would have been out there. People knew it. People knew what the deal was. They just right they because of the exposés of the thirties. Don't want to be assaulted. Right, right because of the exposés of the thirties and forties and stuff like that, and. And, like, when Madison Square Garden was selling out, like, McAdam was telling me, like, in the 50s with, like, these ethnic talents, um, and the newspapers were still, the English language newspapers were still doing digs at the, uh, at the, uh, the, the wrestling, you know, because of the exposés of 20 years earlier. It will be again. Yeah, and it, it's really interesting to see all the cycles that wrestling has gone through. Like, I've been on it for some of its highs and some of its lows. You know, yeah, you were at, you were at like WCW like a lot during your days as a fan, right? Well, there was a, in my area a lot. <laughs> I mean, you know, a lot of those shows were in Georgia, so it was, you know, easy to go to. Right. What was that like? Like going to like a Nitro in '98. <sighs> For instance, yeah, I mean, those, are, those are interesting shows. Uh, I mean, lots, lots of going on. The TV uh, taping before that were extremely long. Oh yeah. Uh, and in, the, in the early mid nineties, but uh, yeah, it was just fun to go to and have you know, it's a good time. And what when you saw for wrestling for the first time? What was your first impression? Right. Um, don't remember who or what. I mean, I, yeah, it was George Jr. Wrestling. That's what I, I mean. I remember more anything else, but uh, I just saw. I, I mean, my family was into it, so it just that's where it spawned from. Watching that one, you know, my dad was watching it, my brothers watched it, so that's just how I got into it, and that's how it's been ever since. Right, and. When you found out that it was fake or uh, fixed, um, it, it's one of those things like you're like, okay, you shrug it off. It didn't matter. <laughs> like, you want to know how. I was, I was young, I knew what it was. I never really. I wasn't one of these that really was gung ho and believing everything was real. You want to know how I found out? You. 
So before SmackDown, it, they were doing a wrestling block on my network TV it, we, when SmackDown was on, like, the former UPN um, thing, um, my network TV. And they had the uh, Harley Race Wrestling Secrets Exposed on before the match, before SmackDown. Yeah, and, I remember that. With the stunt Grammy and the blade, and yeah. that's how I found out. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a lot of a lot of like kids found out, you know, in that time period. You know, those those shows that were out there, because there were multiple versions of that. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Dang, that stuff happens. What they what they said. Are there any interesting behind the scenes tidbits from that show? The one on NBC. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't that much to it. But. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's just interesting. The one with Anthony Durante, Pitbull 2, Michael Modest, Harley Race as the Booker, Eddie Man. And then Eddie Mansfield had one in 1987. Well, the, in 2020, of course, we talked about recently with the Chiefs with John Sauce. So yeah, that was. That's always something that people look back on, you know, because that was the first big one in that era. And Dr. D is actually doing, like, bookings now and stuff like yeah, that. He's, he's back on the scene. So, good for Dr. D to get out there. He's, he's had interesting life. I mean, his life outside of wrestling is probably way more interesting than wrestling, right? Because the guy with a bounty hunter. Oh, <laughs> right. A real life bounty hunter. What? He would go. Repo man, bounty hunter. I mean, he, he, he would go out and do some dangerous stuff. You know, he's still alive, so. Yeah. Because he gets in that business, he brings him to kill. What was your first impression when you saw Ric Flair? Um, as a kid, I always thought he was funny. Um, because he had, he had a great promo. Um, I've always been a Flair fan. And then you have a music collection too, like that spawns many decades. We got it. We got to talk about this because I, I, I host a show here on Monco called Hard and Heavy, where I play like the latest hard rock and then some classic rock, some stuff like that, and it's amazing how music has evolved. Like the wrestling business, you know, in a lot of ways too. It's like some stuff is hot and some stuff, you know, goes away for a while. It's like, you know, and then the rock scene. Yeah. There's really not a rock scene as far as like mainstream music right now. So, yeah. There is a scene, but it's not mainstream. Exactly. You know, it's not like it used to be. It used to be dominated, you know, in a lot of ways. And then it's going to come back. MTV was in there. Heyday, I mean, that was, you know, Raw was a huge force on there, but everything is so poppy and dance oriented now, then, you know. It will come and, back. And will it come back? Well, it did in the, uh, in the 80s. Because that rock scene kind of fell out of the mainstream in the late 70s with disco, but uh, it made us come back as the 80s went along, so, as far as like pop stuff. So, I mean, who knows? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't consider like the Imagine Dragons rock because it's like, no. <laughs> it's, just, it's just different. I mean, it, there's so much the hybrid music now. There's, I mean, it's, it's way different than what it used to be. Yeah, and it's, it's and it's interesting to see all the uh, different personalities that have done wrestling and music, like Gene Oakland, um, Jimmy Hart. Fred Blassie. Yeah, the, the, the wrestling albums and stuff like that. And other people being involved. Hard Slaughter had things on theme song one time. I mean, he, he was different people. Lou Albano uh, managing RBQ. I mean, there, there's a lot of different stuff over the years that wrestling and music have been involved with. And uh, mutually. Like, yeah. wrestling, it, it's such a vast. Top, I call it the perfect amalgamation of 
like comedy, drama, music, everything. You get everything in wrestling, and that's what I truly love about it. Yeah, pretty much. You're right. Um, and it's sort of like, like I, it's transcendent, and there's not many transcendent forms of entertainment that really catch my eye, but wrestling happened to catch my eye, if you know what I mean. And, um, I was thinking, like, 20 more minutes, maybe? Um, like, is there, like, what wrestlers made a strong first impression on you? Brutal Warriors, uh, definitely. Just their look and everything. Uh, just being a dominant force. Um, Dusty Rhodes, the charisma. Yeah. Promos. Uh, man of PA, just the toughness that he is. And he's like the man's man. Um, Nikita Koloff being this Russian powerhouse. Um, guys like that definitely. Um, the horseman in general. Love the horseman, the kid. Um, and uh, just other stuff. I love Ted, uh, Ted DiBiase uh, when he was in Mid South. Oh, yeah. We were, ta- we were talking about DiBiase and Savage, the house show program, me and McAdam the other day. Um, on Sunday, and like, like you sort of could tell like DiBiase was working the gimmick when he was facing Savage in the WWF, but um, it, it it's really interesting to see all the weird house show programs that have happened over the years. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. But DiBiase, we just had this conversation on the show where uh, I mean, when he's WWF, he he he, he, he basically rely on his gimmick and that's what he was needing to do and so yeah, he didn't have to go up there and have the great great matches all the time because the gimmick was carrying the load right uh, so when you watch him in, in this uh, PWF and wherever else you, know, he wrestles, you see a different Teddy Beyonce and he, I mean he was a tremendous performer um, I mean the, the much as I grew up see, I was lucky you know growing up in you know, the Atlanta area, where I was able to have access to, you know, Joe Pettacino's big wrestling block on Channel 36, and then other wrestlers over the shows all over the country, you know, Saturday and Sunday. So, I mean, wrestling was a huge part of my childhood because it was always on television on the weekends. Uh, wrestling, I mean, especially, you know, when football wasn't in season, you know, I wasn't watching football or anything. Um, I was mainly just wrestling or whatever, you know, at this certain point in time. So, uh, what were those wrestling blocks like? Like, like. Well, I mean, it, start, it started out, you know, gradually. I mean, it was a couple hours, and then it was the four hours, and then it went to six hours. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's. You're going from, from on that particular on the station, you're going from 8 p.m. to 3 a.m. Of them to wrestling on Saturday night, and that's following the TBS two-hour show. Right. And, and then our other shows that were randomly on in the morning, the morning or afternoon on other channels. So I mean, wrestling is just dominating your day in a lot of ways. So you're seeing wrestling from around the world. You know that really not a lot of people can get access to in other places. So you know, I was able to watch. Mid South. I was able to watch Continental. I was able to watch Memphis. I was able to watch Chester, Florida. I was able to watch it one time, go to see Puerto Rico. Um, other random stuff. And, you know, of course, Puerto Rico this week was on, and they saw about everybody. So right. You see Port, you see Calgary, you see Japan, you know, you see all kinds Mexico. of on, on those shows. Of course, World Class is on in the area. And, you know, I mean, we got to see basically everything, every breath of emotion I was able to have access to. AWA as well. Of course, so, uh, EMLL. I, it was, that started later. Uh, I was able to start watching, I was able to start watching that in 1989. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, 
there was all kinds of wrestling I was, I was able to watch. Japan was the same way. I had a Japanese friend at school that had a, that would get paid. So I would watch the paid. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I would, I've been able to see everything pretty much. So that's one good thing about being in this area is, is having that exposure. What are some of your favorite angles? Flair, Dusty. I mean, that, yeah, I mean, there's lots of stuff that went on there. I was just an ever, ever going thing. I mean, that went on for, for years. Uh, the trial thing was just people, I mean, what cops to talk about. I mean, Mid, Mid South had a lot. Coal Miner's Glove. Coal Miner's Glove. Well, Doug, give you the odds, it'd be definitely a strong angle. Uh, you know, that's just Mid South and all that stuff. Uh, Go watch me bearing the Russian flag. Always a great angle there. Uh, Memphis, God knows they had plenty of them over the years. Uh, Lawler, they could be in law, get a towel. Uh, um, the D Lawler Lee Town stuff. Uh, Lawler coming back with young referee Jeff Sherry getting a tie about the other being Buddy Landell. Um, God, just so much. I mean, the. Freebirds from the honor is a world class and it's been the you know, major business for years. Um, it's just it's a lot of them. You know, a lot of great angles. That, um, matches, too? Continental, oh God, matches. <laughs> There's so many. Right. A lot, a lot of great Japanese matches over the years. So, I, mean, I, I can't say how many matches I've seen. Uh, I think it's I, I think you can see like any amount of matches and it's like oh my god because I can't tell you it's in the thousands it's in the thousands it's probably in the hundreds of thousands with you yeah it's so many um yep. like as a wrestling collector you, you and a wrestling preserver of history it's like almost second nature Yeah, but see, I'm, I'm, you know, I like more of the complete stuff. Where You're I, a completist? I like complete shows. Yeah. I, I'm not a guy that's real big. I mean, I, I have them and stuff like that, and I've got them, but I'm not like a compilation person. I don't like having full television shows and stuff, everything. I like to have the full grasp of everything I'm watching. Right. And that's always important just to get the full context. Yeah. Uh, I mean, watching a match cold is okay, but I mean, I'd rather know, I'd rather be seeing the promos and the angles, everything that's going on with it. That, that makes it what it is. I was going to ask you about Bill Watts. He is a major figure in wrestling history. Oh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. The wrestler and the promoter. Um,. Some of the stuff is just wild with them. Like, some of the stuff you guys have uncovered specifically. With, like, the Torch Talks. Bill Watts is, uh, if you read his book, I mean, he is what he is. He's a, he's a genuine article. Um, he believes in what he says. He's walking tall. I mean, he is, he is Bill Watts. I mean, he's an alpha male. And, you know, He's apologized for a lot of stuff that he's done over the years, too, but he's still Bill Watts. Right. And, uh, he's a very interesting character, to say the least. He was to this day. Yes. Um, and to this day, it's like Billy Jack Haynes. Like, like oh, oh. Billy Jack Haynes. <laughs> he, I mean, uh, he's had a lot of issues in the past. He said stuff that could be true, but... You gotta take it with a grain of salt. That's one thing you gotta be careful with a lot of these wrestlers. Right. Remember, there to be wrestlers of cons. They're liars and stuff like that. So, yeah, they may be speaking truth, for sure. But you can't just take everything they say as a doc. My last question for you, Chris, before we get into the 
plug section of this show where we can plug everything that you do with all the great stuff. It's how much longer do you envision doing this? As long as I can. As long as you're physically able? As long as I'm mentally able. <laughs> <laughs> like. Uh, physically is one thing, mentally is the other thing. Um, yeah, as long as you can, can, uh, can do it without, you know, me trying to strangle it through the phone, through the phone line sometimes. Uh, I bet that's happened several times. <laughs> well, hey, you know, every good partnership, and they, you know, they have their uh, their times where they have disagreements and stuff, and that's just the way it is. But you know, I, we we've had our spats off air and on air, and everything's all right in the end. So that's just the way it is. Right, every good partnership. <laughs> And it's not the way life should be, you know. It's like I, I have learned. I've learned. We have disagreements, and we, and I have had people flat out not accept my apologies for things I said like two years ago, and it hurts me. Yeah, 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 you know, to no end. Okay. Yeah, that that's what that's the attitude I've gotten now because it's like. I let the stuff like because I have mental illness and stuff like that, and and like I've let stuff get to me and I would explode and at people and I'm like, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, just don't worry about it, you know. You know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry about it at all. Yeah, yeah, and it's like it's like, I. And that's what people keep telling me, and I I have to just keep instilling it into my brain instead of holding grudges and stuff like that, because that that, that doesn't work with anybody, you know. Yeah. You know, uh, plugs, man. All right, uh, everything that I do, audio wise, is uh, on our SoundCloud page. Probably the easiest way to get to it is BetweenTheSheetsPod.com. That's a straight there. Um, all the Between the Sheets episodes, the regular shows, Exile on Bad Street, everything is there. So you can go check it out there. Uh, uh, new shows every Monday for Between the Sheets. And uh, we got two food. Basically this week, uh, we have the main show, which is everything except the U.S. From '96 during uh, the week of uh, March the 13th and the 19th, uh, our different Alan uh, Cunahan, Alan Perel on Twitter. Yes, I love him. And uh, we talk about all kinds of good stuff on there. And then Bo James, who we talked about before on the show, is on during the U.S. Independence segment, which wasn't intended to be a song show, but it got that way. Yeah, so, it always does. <laughs> so, uh, Bo definitely did a lot of storytelling. Because uh, he's pretty, he is actual promotion ran that way. The first time we really have covered, have covered his promotion. So, so he had stories of booking and stuff like that and everything. Yeah, I can't wait to lot, delve into it. Lot, yeah, a lot of stuff to have. I mean, it's almost ten hours of audio we dropped today. So, and another hour and a half with you and me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can follow me on Twitter at DJ D Cooks Russell and DJ D Cooks Music for my music stuff and my wrestling stuff. And keep up to date with me. You can follow me on Instagram at dcookiepunk43. I have had pictures of everything that I have done over the past few years. And it's always fun. And thank you all for listening. You, this is Meet the Press Slam. And you were listening to that on Monka Radio, where music and minds meet.